Um, we want to call this meeting to order. Um, we are looking at taking the roll call first, and we will establish the quorum. We please call the roll. Senator Whaler. Representative Lewis. Here. Pat Abel. Rocky Adkins. Charles Byers. Jacqueline Coleman. Laurie Givens. Carol Henderson. John Hicks. Patsy Jackson. Holly Johnson. Ryan Neff. Mark Overstreet. Katie Shepard. Representative McCool. And Senator Southworth presiding. Here. And uh, we also want to make note, I think we had Senator Wheeler walk in uh, for the record. And first, first, I'd like to introduce and welcome our newest, but not new, board member, uh, Director John Hicks from the Budget Director's Office. And we he previously served... Um, from 2006 to 2016 on this committee, he brings a wealth of knowledge and looking forward to having him here and helping us as we move through these projects and planning. So welcome. Thank you for being here and joining us. Um, as a side note, also, uh, Director Hicks has been appointed to uh, replace um, our former member was uh, the Cabinet Secretary Michael Brown, and he has resigned and accepted a position at Simmons College in Louisville. So we're we're always glad to see our new and old members back. Um, first on our agenda, we have informational items. You'll see in your notes a number of informational items. Let me go behind that first. We have the minutes from the October 13th meeting. We need to approve these. We have a motion to approve. Okay, motion and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Um, jumping on ahead to our informational items. First, we have the budget update from the 2022 session. I think Corey has that for us, right? Yes. Information item 4A highlights items concerning the board's recommendations in the 22 to 2028 statewide capital improvements plan included in the capital projects budget section of the 22 to 24 executive branch budget bill. Attachment A reflects the requested funding for maintenance pool necessary to maintain state-owned state -owned property, the appropriated amounts, and a comparison to the appropriated amounts in the 22 2020 to 22 executive branch budget. Attachment B list all of the projects recommended by the board in the statewide capital improvements plan and the appropriated amount in the executive branch budget bill. And finally, attachment C is a table reflecting all projects included in at least one executive branch budget bill version. The table includes fund sources, appropriation amounts, and some notes from staff op observations. The table reflects a continual progression of the budget bill as it progressed through each chamber from left to right. Each modification for a project from the previous version of the bill will have an appropriation amount outlined with a bold border. The final two pages of the attachment reflect the budget bill for the Transportation Cabinet, excluding the Department of Highways, and the budget bill for the Judicial Branch. I want to say thank you to our fantastic staff. Um, we're happy... Corey's not brand new, but um, he's been taking a major role in putting a lot of these things together for us, and these are very helpful. Um, we have a lot we can celebrate right now. Um, this maintenance pools, if you take a look at the maintenance pool numbers, you recall maintenance pools is our policy priority number two. Uh, in the past, for particularly, we've seen um, them not quite funded super well and this year I feel like we have more funding than we've seen in a while and then the other thing I wanted to also point out is um, the votes that we made last year and trying to pick out some things that stuck out to us in attachment B all the things that actually came through on the budget that we had selected some of them obviously didn't come through but some of those even 
are going to be included. For example, you'll see the various universities and things um, are being consolidated in some ways. So even more than is even reflected on this list, I think we've seen get funded. So that's exciting. Okay, uh, staff. We've got staff report on the post-secondary. Is that Corey also? Yes, that's me as well. Um, information item 4B provides a brief analysis of the $683.5 million asset preservation pool uh, for the post-secondary institutions. Included are tables reflecting the general fund supported bond fund appropriations and the match required of each institution. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our agency maintenance pool, you'll notice, has been funded by general funds, and we're up 133%, according to the notes here we have in our reports. Um, that's good news. Uh, the other thing that I do notice here on our CPE maintenance pool, we did reach almost the full $700 million that they had requested. Um, unfortunately, the matching funds aren't quite up to where we thought they would be according to the request they we, we thought they had originally said they wanted 700 million and they would have they thought 350 million to match so they would have a total operating pool of just right over a billion dollars and it looks like the matching funds aren't coming in that much so we're maybe a little bit shy on the totals um, but the other thing i want to take note of is these are not um general funds these are actually bond funds and so as we move forward we're going to need to think about policy priorities when we should be funding maintenance pools with bonds. Um, I think that's certainly an issue we'll want to take a look at uh, as we move forward. Um, okay, finally, let's do the information item uh, C. Sean has that, and we can ask questions after those. The last information item is a news article regarding the Kentucky Exposition Center and its future plan. The State Fair Board has received 200 million bond funds in the current budget for a property improvements pool. According to the article, 20 million will be available for maintenance, and the remaining 180 million will be available for development. The proposal for the new development must be submitted no later than December, and when that becomes available to the public, we will share that with you. I might point out that in the last capital plan, the State Fair Board reported the need for 18 million over the three biennia to address their maintenance needs at their facilities. And those facilities include over 2 million square feet at the Kentucky Exposition Center and the Kentucky International Convention Center. Thank you. Does anyone have any comments or questions on any of these items that, are, that we're looking at or just went through? Yeah, Director Hicks. Thank you, Madam Chair. As a new member, but as a longtime fan, uh, of, of this uh, this was an amazing budget for because of the availability of, of one-time resources particularly but what I think it also showed was the value of this body and the planning processes that this body kind of oversees is because we were we were ready for this amount of money in terms of the efforts that state agencies and the institutions of post-secondary make, particularly in the judicial branch, in, in, you know, in continuously keeping up with their asset inventory and the maintenance needs of theirs. So, so I would say we've had the nexus of good process and then the availability of funding. And, you know, and this, was, this was a great example of, I'll call it, you know, the value of this, this, or, this body. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, seeing none. Um, we will move on to our next agenda item presentation by the Kentucky Department of Education. We have the impact on inflation with these current school facility construction projects. Mr. Che Ritter is the division director. Um, Mr. Ritter, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and explain what you do and what you have to present for us. We'd appreciate it. Thank sure. You. Thank you very much, Senator Southworth. My name is Che Ritter I'm with the Kentucky Department of Education. I'm a division director with the Office of Finance and Operations. Uh, we oversee, um, obviously, the facilities, uh, some of the construction portion of that, 
and uh, in our same office, school and community nutrition, uh, trans school transportation, uh, SEEK funding that many of you are familiar with. So we interact with all the school districts uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and today I've been invited over. And first of all, let me say I appreciate the opportunity to speak with this group because usually I'm in front of ANR or one of the education subcommittees. So this is a little different for us, but this is also a very different topic for us too. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all virtually. I wish I could have been there in person. Um, but today I'd like to share with you all some information. And some of this is uh, probably more relevant today than it ever has been. Um, I think this topic is gonna to stay on the front burner for us as, uh, as we're involved in school facilities construction for the next couple of years. And obviously a lot of this is, uh, you know, hinged on speculation that, you know, cost will continue to go up and inflation will impact school facility projects. Um, but we found this to be very important. We're hearing a lot of conversations from our districts, board members, superintendents, construction companies, architects about this very topic, uh, which is, you know, impacting uh, decisions every day. So, um, Senator Southworth, your permission, I'd like to go ahead and start, uh, if that's okay with you. Please proceed. Thank you very much. And I'm going to try to get past the technical part of this. And please let me know if you see the slides here in just a second. And we'll slide that. Are, are my slides showing on your side? We do not see your slides. Okay. Now we see your slides. Okay. Is this full screen? It is not. There we go. Now it is. Okay, great. Okay. Sorry about that. I knew there'd be something I had to work on over here. Again, Che Ritter with the Kentucky Department of Education. And what I'm going to try to do today is give you a very uh, high level overview of the process. Uh, one thing that's very important uh, with this process is understanding, you know, sort of how the, the seed gets planted uh, on some of these construction projects and how it uh, takes a while. It's a, it's a pretty lengthy and involved process, but for good reason. Uh, these are tax dollars that are being spent on facilities and the expectation is these facilities will be built in a manner that's consistent with obviously, you know, building and housing codes, but also to last. Uh, these are serious investments. Um, and going back and I've been with the department, you know, around 15 to 20 years, school construction costs have gone up um, but regardless of when they built the school, we all have that expectation these buildings will be there for a very long time and have a great and useful life. Uh, so obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about the funding, because that's always a topic. Uh, the financing, and something that we do every biennium with the General Assembly called the Need and Unmet Need. And some of you may have heard of that before, but we interact quite a bit with the School Facilities Construction Commission on that um, issue as well. And something that's... Uh, that you all actually passed a couple of years ago, this Kentucky Facilities Inventory Classification System. Um, I'll get into that a little bit and how that interacts with what we're doing today. Uh, House Bill 678, which is very recent, last session uh, that you all passed and how that's impacting districts and actually helping uh, some districts. And we'll talk a little bit about construction, of course, always time for questions. And at any time, any of these slides, just uh, stop me if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. So the very first part is the planning. Um, you know, it, it always reminds me of a game called Sim City, where you've got kind of a blank screen. You start building something. You've got to plan a little bit. And one of the things that, um, you know, the department does is we have some guardrails uh, and some framework for the what we call the district facility planning process. And there's a local planning committee. Emphasis is on the local. Um, KDE is not really involved. We don't show up and tell them what to do. There's a KDE, usually someone there to kind of help guide them, but we're not making decisions for them. And this committee has got about 10 to 20 members, parents, teachers, building administrators, facility directors, uh, central office staff, and of course, uh, the superintendent um, are involved in this. And I've been a director now for a little bit over two years, I think, as of this month. And, you know, in talking to superintendents and occasionally, um, you know, other people involved in this process, that we think this local planning committee works very well. Uh, it does get a lot of local input on these decisions. And, of course, with these decisions, 
Um, you know, these impact kids that aren't even born yet. Uh, so these are very important decisions. We want to get the right people in there and get the right input. So one thing they want to look at as a group is what, you know, not only what their, you know, wants are, but what, what their demographics look like. You know, what kind of population are they projected to have? And I'm going to pick on a few districts that I'm friendly with, but Scott County is one that we always kind of look at because of their growth of population. Um, how do they build today for a population that might not be there yet? And sometimes they may look at birth rates. They may look at, you know, how many kids are in third grade and how big of a high school you need when those third graders are freshmen and things like that. Um, but financial capability is really important too. That's probably one of the most important. And that's probably the one we sweat about the most because you can have all the dreams and you can say, we were going to have to have this much room for these kids, but you've also got to have the capability of paying for it. And they will uh, sort of address their needs based on our Kentucky schools planning manual, which is sort of a guide uh, that they use to, when you build a school, you need this much room for this type of classroom. And, you know, all it gets into the minutia of how these buildings should be built. So there's a minimum of three public meetings and every four years, this district facility plan should be updated by the district and that local planning committee. And they can extend it uh, for an additional four years if they you know, are sort of in the middle of you know, doing some construction and wanna wait until a project's done or there's a reason they just think our, our right now our plan is okay and we just wanna extend it out a little bit. Um, but I think one reason it's every four years is because we want it to stay fairly fresh um, and active. We don't want it to become so dormant that you know, they've just kind of let it uh, kind of age out. Um, and frankly, if you go to Google and type in any school district and the letters DFP behind that name, you should be able to pull up their most recent DFP. It's on our website and you can kind of see uh, we'll talk a little bit here in just a second about priorities, but you can see uh, how the work gets into a final product and, you know, what, uh, for example, Anderson County, what their DFP looks like, and maybe what they're wanting to do in the next biennium and things like that. So it does kind of give you a preview of what the district would like to do. So again, talk about priorities that I just mentioned. So priority one, these are the basically in the next biennium, what they'd like to address. And if you'll notice, I use the word educational projects, which we consider school buildings. Um, this would be your elementary, middle and high schools. Um, and priority two, same types of buildings, but maybe not in the next biennium. Um, and when you think of it, uh, I live in Franklin County. So uh, I think our last uh, new school uh, when I was in school was probably they came in and did Peaks Mill Elementary, uh, which that would have been on their DFP at the time as a priority one. Uh, and then maybe a couple of years later, they updated Westridge, which would have been a priority two. Uh, priority three, these are mostly your, what I would call kind of your operational areas, cafeterias and kitchens, which are in the schools, obviously, but not really classrooms per se. And you've got some administrative areas and priority four is just your management support areas like central offices and bus garages. And of note, the discretionary projects, these are ones that don't really meet these other areas, but they also include athletic facilities. And you've probably um, noticed, or if you've you know, paid attention to a lot of school facilities, whenever they build a high school, obviously the athletic facilities are a big part of that project. And the reason those are held in sort of a different priority, and we'll get into that in just a second, because it, it, it gets into the restrictions on funding and what they can use that funding for and you know, what this means for districts when they're doing their planning. Um, and this also includes something called excess space. Uh, so the planning manual that I mentioned previously sort of restricts them based on the population and some projections. You know, we obviously don't want a district to build a high school that's way overbuilt because it costs a lot of additional money to build it, but also to maintain it, and to heat and cool it. So we kind of have a model that helps them keep it within a range. But in some cases, they may want to do something a little different and add, you know, an extra, uh, you know, 4,000 square feet for a little bit larger auditorium or uh, some additional classrooms or whatnot. And so this can be done using that discretionary priority five category. So funding, um, this is where I kind of cut my teeth as a young man at KDE is talking about local taxes. Um, and these, you've, if you've paid attention to the budget and conversations with districts, you'll hear a lot about nickels. And it's, 
it's not really a mystery what these are. They're taxes uh, restricted to facilities. And you'll hear it, uh, especially around tax season, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks for school districts. A lot of them that have these, um, what it is, it's every district has a uh, one nickel and it's restricted for facilities and the state through the biennial budget actually equalizes it. It's not really a match because there's a formula, but it equalizes it. And some districts uh, throughout time, the General Assembly's written language for specific reasons, and I'll give you a few quick examples. Um, there was a growth nickel. So districts that met a criteria where they were growing very fast, and the example is always Oldham County back in the day, uh, they were growing very fast. Of course, if you're getting a lot of new students, you know, you're going to have to split an elementary, build a new one, or your middle school's got to split up. So this allowed them to reach those facility goals because they were just getting, you know, tons of new kids coming into their district. Uh, there was another years later called the BRAC nickel, which is base realignment committee. And this was back, if you recall, um, around Hart for Hardin County, because they weren't quite sure what the federal government was going to do with Fort Knox. And there was uh, sort of an influx of students. Uh, their parents had to uh, probably not so voluntarily go to Fort Knox. So the kids followed, which ended up in the Hardin County School District. So it helped Hardin County address their facility needs at the time. And uh, I think it was in 2010, off memory, that there was one called the Category 5 nickel. And this was interesting because there was actually sort of a graded system called the Parsons Report. And the General Assembly wanted to knock out you know, 10 of the worst buildings we had in the state. So the category five nickel was for those buildings. And those districts were able to address those specific buildings. And these were, you know, relatively bad shape. So that nickel went right to those buildings for, uh, to pay for the 20 year bonds. And again, the, the important part of that too, is that's equalized by the general assembly and the budget bill. So it's uh, that local effort plus state effort, which makes a huge difference in, you know, helping these districts reach their goals. Um, now, there's only one active nickel right now, meaning there's only one that school districts can adopt. And it's called the recallable nickel uh, without getting into a great amount of detail because these nickels, the processes get a little complicated. But basically, uh, if they want to do it, it uh, the voters can petition it, uh, which in some case happens. And then they do it. We'll usually do a special election or wait till the next general election to actually vote on that issue. In some cases, the public may not petition it and it just passes and then it's on their tax bill. Uh, but some districts will have multiples of these. Uh, and this is one thing we'll talk to about in just a second. They'll have multiple nickels and they've done a lot of local effort and the state's equalizing it, but it may still not be enough to get them over that hump with their facilities plan. The other uh, group, which uh, School Facilities Construction Commission, SFCC, as some of you may know them by, of course, this is a, a small group of two people and a commission, uh, but they also have offers of assistance. Uh, like I said earlier, we interact with them quite a bit great relationship with them over the years and we work together on uh, developing something called the unmet and uh, unmet need and need and I'll talk about that in a second but these offers are incredibly important uh, this is if you will sort of help uh, in some cases tie these projects together um, you know between their local taxes and your equalization that you put in the general uh, the budget the general assembly puts in the budget this offers of assistance kind of can kind of push them over that finish line so um, it's a very important part of the budget bill. And then there's the special offers of assistance. Um, the, this, again, is just another, um, I think I'm going to say in the neighborhood of 100 million and change last time, if I remember. And these uh, go to specific districts based on specific criteria criteria uh, determined by the General Assembly. And you can go back and look through the budget bills and you'll see different lists of different districts. Um, I think in the last one I just had up a while ago, I think there's a, I'm going to say uh, Ludlow was in there and Carter County. And if you go back to the last budget, uh, it's again spread all over the state. So this is an additional way to address facility needs. And in some cases, uh, it may be um, a district really needs help because their building's in terrible shape or they can't quite get enough money to do it. So this is why it's considered a special offer of assistance. And again, all that's in the budget bill. So financing, um, each of our districts, obviously, you know, as a taxing authority, um, they, you know, generate money off local taxes. Uh, as I'm sure if you've got property or a car, when you get your tax bill, there's a significant portion of that tax bill that goes towards your local school district. Some districts will do utility taxes, um, which is on the usage, and some will also do occupational tax. 
Um, but, you know, basically their ability to generate money is restricted to local taxes. And obviously the state funding that comes through SEEK. And if you're looking at it in bigger picture numbers, uh, it's around, you know, roughly two plus billion in state funding in SEEK alone. And then local taxes are about a little bit over two billion as well. And if you add up all the other stuff, uh, as we often do for, you know, how much money is the state putting into, you know, K through 12 education, it increases significantly. There's on behalf, there's retirement uh, on behalf insurance. There's a lot of money that goes into this. But as far as buildings are concerned, uh, there's some restricted buckets of money, if you will. And it only goes toward those buildings. So those nickels, the equalization. There's also what we call capital outlay, uh, which is $100 per student. And if I believe if memory serves, that's been $100 per student since 1954. Um, but 80% of that can be used for bonding. So if I'm a school district and I want to build just a, a generic elementary school and I've got the land, um, I can go to my fiscal agent uh, who will help me issue a bond. And of course, you know, much like us, when we go to the bank to get a mortgage, you know, there's an underlying asset. And the bondholders, the people that buy the bonds, obviously want to make sure they get paid back. And cre so credit rating is a huge, huge deal. Um, and the school districts are hyper aware of this, as are the fiscal agents. And obviously, I think everybody that's in state government is aware of credit ratings. Um, so but the other things outside of their control, like interest rates, just like you and I, uh, if I went back in time and bought uh, or got a mortgage at the lowest interest rate possible and then move forward to today, there's a significant difference in my buying power. Uh, and as interest rates increase, of course, that reduces the amount of uh, building that these school districts can do. And of course, existing debt service, you know, what they've done in the past if they borrowed to build a middle school, but they're trying to start an elementary school um, and they're, you know, they've got some debt service already. So really this is akin to just like you and I, if, you know, we've got a mortgage and a car payment, and we want to, you know, I don't know, buy a boat. That's another payment. It's going to put some more stress on our debt load and things like that. So what can happen is this gap in funding. And, you know, when a board starts to talk about their DFP and their district facility plan, and they think, well, we'd really like to start this elementary school project. Um, and they, they, they talk to the fiscal agent, they've got a you know, an estimated cost of the project. And they say, well, how much can we borrow? And how much, you know, how much can we do here? If the building's going to cost them 50 million and they can only generate 40 million in bonding potential, you've got this $10 million gap. So they get to that decision point, which is, well, how do we address this? Do we reduce the scope of the building? Do we, you know, cut some corners off of it? Or do we phase it in? And phasing it in is simply put, you know, you're going to build it in sections, basically. We'll build it to a point we can use it. But then a couple of years later, when we have a little more money, we'll come back and maybe add another wing or, you know, they'll design the building so they can do that. And the architects that help them design these things and all the construction companies will help them sort of plan out, you know, you can build this section now and then come back in a couple of years and, you know, attach uh, another wing for the school or put grades nine and 10 on this end of the building. And of course, there's a lot of logistics because you're moving some students around, you know, while you're building and things like that, too. So this um, can be, you know, this is that really the crux of one of the issues we deal with a lot of districts, I think, deal with and boards is, you know, how do we tackle this and how do we you know, deal with this gap? So this need and unmet need is really a, a very simple concept. It's the, we do this every biennium and we share it with the School Facilities Construction Commission. And in the, our last time we did it, this, this, all the school districts combined have about $6 billion worth of unmet need. And this is basically everything that's on their district facility plan that's not yet been addressed. So it's kind of the wish list, if you will. And so it's, it's a big number and it's not supposed to shock anybody, but it's a huge number. And to give you some context, Jefferson County uh, is a pretty good chunk of that because, you know, they've recently had a tax that passed and they're starting to address a lot of their kind of aging facility issues there. And, you know, I think they were just south of a billion dollars. And with their recent tax increase, they'll be able to address, I want to say it was like half a billion dollars of that. So our expectation is, is that JCPS will be really doing a lot of renovations and construction in the near future uh, because of that local tax that they've generated, um, not in the last couple of years or about a year, year and a half or so. So 
if you're basically these are all the projects one through four if we go back a couple slides on that priority list and we subtract um, any projects that have just got started and this helps SFCC develop their offers of assistance so if your portion of that need is three percent when they uh, get their money from SFCC, it'd be 3% of a total. So if you, the General Assembly gives them, I don't, I'm just going to use a round number, say $100 million, then a district might get 3% of that for their offers of assistance. But it's a rather interesting calculation just because you can see, you know, districts that have addressed their need will have a lower need, obviously. And some districts just can't afford to address all their needs, you know, or they're chipping away at it, is what we usually call it. So this is just a calculation to help kind of determine what's the need, you know, statewide. Then there's the Kentucky Facilities Inventory Classification System. And the key word here is inventory. And if you think of inventory, just like a business, it's the, the, the school districts are basically going out and looking in their facilities and looking at age and condition, uh, the floor plans. And even, you know, if you have an older school and, and this is obviously, you know, not something we, we like, but now we have to think about, you know, crime prevention through environmental design. We have to think about security and safety a lot more than we used to. So these things are, you know, they may use an outside service for this, an outside architecture firm to come in and do this form, and they can do it themselves too. Uh, this is not mandatory, but what this list does is it helps us get a better picture of the sort of the guts of all these buildings. And you may have a building built in 1930, but the condition is in pretty good shape. And you may have one built in 1975, but the condition is not in great shape. It may have some, you know, very serious HVAC issues or whatever it may be. But this gives us a better, better picture. And this is available online. You can go to our website. And we do an official report that we send to the Legislative Research Commission, General Assembly, and others. Um, and this is later used in some cases as sort of a component to determine, you know, which buildings can we address with our special offers of assistance? And one of those is, you know, if we're looking at the oldest buildings that haven't been addressed yet, plus, you know, condition, plus this and that, but it's an inventory of existing buildings. What it doesn't do is tell you what's on the district facility plan. So you sort of have to push the two together to understand, well, you know, if this building is not in great shape, does the district just want to build a new one? And that's sort of a, that's a hard decision point. That's not one that KDE necessarily makes. And there's some rules about buildings that are 30 years old and older too. But we also recognize there's school districts with some older buildings. And I'll pick on one down the street from you all, Frankfurt Independent. You know, they've got some older buildings that are well-maintained. Um, but obviously for them to go out and buy acreage and build a brand new building would be difficult within their boundaries. So, you know, every district's kind of got a different situation and some districts are, you know, they're surrounded by plenty of land and others aren't. Uh, some like Mayfield are right in the middle of the town and things like that. So um, this is a very important uh, tool, uh, but again, using it, you know, correctly and making sure we understand what we're looking at. And also, you know, kind of using it in conjunction with that district facility plan. I think it, it gives us a lot of good information about these facilities. So last session, House Bill 678, this is about a two and a half page bill that was passed, and I believe unanimously, if I remember correctly, but in two and a half pages, it changed a lot of stuff dramatically. So over time, as I became director, there was a, you know, there's a big process to get a building from, you know, for sort of the, the ground level to let's, you know, dig the dirt, get the foundation board and get this thing built. And it took a lot of time and a lot of review. Uh, so House Bill 678 allows districts to sort of skip through some of the review process. And they basically adopt a resolution. Now, when I say skip the review process, I want to emphasize, we're not saying you can just like ignore all the rules and do whatever you want to do. The districts, this sort of turn, we hand the keys over to the districts to make sure they're going to follow the rules. And there are a lot of them. Um, they're still using our system, which is called FactPack, which collects a lot of information when they're you know, developing their plans. Um, so we can track these projects. They're supposed to upload all these documents and obviously follow you know, all the safety rules, ADA compliance, building and housing codes and things like that. But this is a big shift. And you know, so far, I think we've gotten a neighborhood, 140 districts out of 171 have signed up or their boards rather have adopted the resolution. So what this resolution does is allows them to conduct new construction renovations and they can do it. Basically, they're not waiting on our review. Our review process did take quite a while. 
and uh, Representative Massey actually was the sponsor of this bill and in conversations with him, this was just to help accelerate these projects because the wave of cost increases was, you know, right behind these projects. It was coming right at them pretty quickly. And, you know, this also changed something which was kind of a, a, I think a major gripe, I think I can say that, uh, from some districts that, you know, the restricted funds through these nickels, including local and state equalization, you couldn't use them on extracurricular activities, including athletic facilities. So when you built a high school, uh, you were, you were kind of handcuffed. You couldn't build the new football stadium, baseball, softball field, things like that without using general funds or addressing every other project you had in priorities one through four. So this allows them a lot more flexibility. And I think it's been um, very welcome by the school districts. And my note here says 139. I do think we're at 140 or 141. I was trying to get that number and it changes uh, relatively, uh, we're adding like, one, it really picked up the last couple of months, but it's finally slowing down. So the majority of our districts are operating under this. Um, so we think that, um, and you know, there's some other parts of this bill that will have KDEs reviewing all our regulations with facilities. Uh, this has been ongoing for months and months and months. And we're really taking what I think is the deepest dive we've done in many years on some of our regulations and the requirements trying to streamline, trying to cut red tape, uh, get rid of some of the bureaucratic hurdles, as well as work with these districts. We have a kind of a small task force we talk to occasionally to bounce some ideas off of to make sure, is this a good change for districts, us, and transparency? Uh, that's still important as we want to make sure that, you know, what we're asking districts to do or what districts are wanting to do is going to get, still get us a good building and a safe building and built well to last and things like that. So I stole some charts from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics because we felt, um, you know, really this conversation is a lot about inflation. Uh, I'm not a, um, you know, I didn't have a degree in economics, but we could tell very quickly in the phone calls we were getting, um, nothing quite sends fear through a superintendent like increased construction costs when they're starting a project. I've gotten that call so many times I have literally forgotten who I've spoken to about which project because it's been the same conversation. You know, they were ready to go. They, they kind of stepped off the, the diving board and all of a sudden the water, you know, went out from underneath them and they had to go back and figure out, well, what do we do? Our costs just went up significantly. And this chart goes back to 2006. This is new school building construction. You know, not too surprising here, but the reason I want to include that and then jump into this one, same information, new school building construction, is just a shorter time frame. you know, sort of uh, pre-pandemic. Um, and then, you know, sort of like where we are now, you can see the significant increase. And, you know, this tells you part of the story, uh, of course, with, uh, you know, everything, it just depends on where you are and what you're building. Uh, but we felt this was important to include. And one thing I want to include on the end of this presentation is just some examples. Um, these are recent ones. These are people who I actually spoke to, and reached out to. Um, I could probably spend the next month getting more and more examples of these projects. But I thought these were fairly indicative of the topic of the day. Um, Menifee County uh, is one a, a district we're pretty close with because they were under state management a few years ago um, and very happily are basically on their own now and doing fantastic. And, you know, Menifee County needed to build a new board office. So this is going to be some new construction. Um, this one, about two to two and a half million in August of 21. Um, not quite a year later, uh, those estimates jumped up to three and a half million. And so I was speaking with their finance officer and they actually removed some work to save a bit of money. They removed the basement out of this building, uh, which was going to be for storage and removed it to save some money. And so, again, that decision point of, well, you know, how do we do this? You know, how do we afford this? So that was basically they cut part of the building out quite literally. Uh, Round County, Rodburn Elementary, this is a renovation in addition. Uh, this one wasn't too severe, but I think it's, you know, again, November of 21 through March, that's not a very long time frame, and it still went up quite a bit, you know, not quite a million dollars, but it's getting there. Um, and in speaking with their finance officer, they did expect future revisions to estimates to increase the cost. Um, so again, you know, this one didn't shock me too much. And Christian County, and I've got some updated information on this one, actually, I think as of like two days ago, 
Um, this Christian County had two high schools. Um, they determined they, their local planning committee went through the district facilities planning process that we talked about earlier and the board uh, approved their district facility plan. And part of that was is to consolidate uh, their two high schools into one. So the initial estimate was around 107 million, 117 a couple months later. And you push out just a few months later and it's up to about 137 million. And just about two days ago, their bids came in. At, I think it was $193 million. So I just saw, I think this morning I read it, that they're actually going to review their bids and they may, I think they were basically reviewing them to see if they can, you know, send the bids back for uh, review or reject, or I'm not sure what their next step is on that one. But obviously to go from 107 million to 193, uh, granted, this is a large project consolidating two high schools. This is going to be a very large high school, uh, but still that's a, just a massive increase. And in talking with the district, you know, I asked them quite frankly, you know, what they thought their issues were. And of course, we always talk about material, you know, steel, concrete, um, just everything that goes into building a building, um, as well as labor. But one thing he mentioned that was one of their major issues was timing. And traveling back in time and hindsight being what it was, Christian County tried to pass a nickel, it was not successful. So they had to kind of wait to figure out their funding and to see if they could do it. And, you know, you never know if that nickel had passed, they may have been able to start sooner, obviously, and save some money. But of course, you know, hindsight being what it is, it's always easy to look back at that. Uh, but this one, I thought just stood out as a, a pretty uh, wild example of how the cost have just really exceeded um, any expectations, I think, um, with all good intent. You know, they they really want to do this project, I know, and it's just gotten very expensive in a hurry. And I think the last example I have is Woodford County, which is right next door to Frankfurt, of course. So many of you are probably familiar with their high school. It sits there right on the main highway as you come into town. And, you know, in July of 19, it was about a $36 million project. They, too, were trying to pass a nickel. Um, and they just uh, couldn't quite get it through. So they did some um, work on their finances and were able eventually to get it to a point where they could afford to build this high school. But in that time, you know, it's practically doubled, um, you know, three years later. And again, you know, we feel like without being uh, deep into the weeds of this, that it's probably materials and labor, uh, as simple as that. So again, to kind of summarize all this, construction costs, um, you know, can exceed this bond potential pretty easily. And that district facility plan is an incredibly important document. Uh, to me, it's always painted the picture of every district we have, 171 of them, of what they want their future to look like. And, you know, these are such serious investments, big, huge investments. Um, you know, they have to make decisions if, if the cost is too much. Much like us, if we were to build a house and our builder comes back to us and say, well, bad news, lumber went up and you're going to have to do make some decisions. You know, those decisions may mean you reduce the scope of the project. You may not build that garage. Well, they may not, you know, get that basement in Menifee County. It's the same concept. Um, they may have to do it in phases. You know, we might have to add the garage in a couple of years when we get some money saved up. And in some cases, they may shelve the project altogether. I know Fayette County had a middle school. When they got the bids, they just, you know, kind of walked away from it for a bit, I think. And now I, th I believe now they've kind of back, kind of gone back to see if they could do it or build this middle school. But these are tough decisions because obviously we can't predict what construction costs will look like in a year, two years, five years, et cetera. Um, districts um, are putting in local effort, and that's a, we feel is an important part of this process. Um, and, but some districts are putting in more than local effort. They're putting double and triple local effort. Um, you know, more of their taxes going towards these projects. They just still are not able to reach it. The cost just sort of outpaced their local effort, if you will. And of course, with any of these projects, you know, your mileage may vary. The, the conditions are very different. And just anecdotally, you know, in talking to superintendents, North Kentucky may be a little higher in their cost per square foot because of labor. Um, and in some cases, uh, it, it's hard to find uh, brick masons, for example. So you have to, you know, pay more to get someone over there. Um, so every project's a little bit different. Size is important, obviously. Um, and, and driving by some of the schools around here, and I see them doing work, um, you know, sometimes these projects take a very short amount of time. Sometimes they're simple renovations, and other times they're very involved, uh, huge projects, which, you know, once they're committed to it, um, it's, it's just, you know, 
it takes a long time to finish these up. So it's not to say that every project is going to experience the same percentage of increases, but we certainly see a pattern developing here. And I think that's my last slide, I believe. And certainly happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much for the um, thorough presentation. Um, I'll open it up to questions first before I have mine. Representative McCool. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ritter, for your report today. Certainly Thank did you. an outstanding job of, of the overall uh, view on how this these projects work. But And you mentioned this within your presentation, but I want to kind of drill down in on uh, probably 12 to 14 schools, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. There may be a different number than that, and you would certainly know that better than I would. But those schools that, that have done all that they can do, the local communities, they've passed mm -hmm. a nickel twice. They've got the equalization passed to the legislature twice. But due to inflation and high cost of construction, materials, and whatever, there there still has a gap there. And, and, and you may not have it for this presentation, and that's fine. So what we'll what we do is include it in the next uh, meeting, hopefully. Uh, Madam Chair will agree with that that you bring forth those schools, the cost. What I'm looking for is, is those schools, those 12 to 14, and again, that number may change, that's done all that they can do, but yet there's a gap funding need there. And we need to know what that gap funding need is as, as a whole and for individual schools. Now, we may or may not be able to do anything, but we need to see what that looks like. That's the first question. Yes. Uh, so there, we can pull that information together. It takes us a little of time because we're going, we want to reach out and get some more recent estimates. And it's kind of a moving target. So um, we want to keep that in mind when we get this list together. That you know what numbers they give me, we'll check with their fiscal agents as well, uh, and what they expect the gap to be. Um, and I know we've talked um, a little bit about the gap in funding. And like you said, I think you put it very well. The districts have done everything they can do locally. And, you know, quite frankly, the state has, uh, will be equalizing that effort. Um, but still, again, it's just not enough to reach that um, sort of the hurdles moved a little higher, uh, which has been beyond everyone's control here, uh, that, you know, costs have gone up. But we will absolutely get you that list of districts. Yes, go ahead and ask your whole line. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate that because hopefully we'll have this for the next uh, next meeting. It gives us a clear picture on what the needs are. Um, again, um, when you have new construction, generally what that means is you have an old building. Does that mean there is a plan on these? And I, we need to know this too. What are they going to do with the old building? If they keep it, then they got to maintain the cost of the upkeep of the building. If they demolish it, then that d does away with that. So there may be some need that they, reason that they need to keep it, and I understand that, but that needs to be on this report as well. Okay. Uh, and then, then one final question is, and I want to ensure because of safety that uh, any new construction or renovation that somehow the state SRO officer or that, cabinet or department signs off on that to ensure that all the safety precautions are are made prior to construction because as you know as, as well as I do that uh, um, when you do a change order not only is the cost of inflation going up when you do a change order in any kind of construction that price is out the roof so yes uh, the fewer change orders you have the the better off you are so we absolutely we need to do that up front so about the SROs is that are you communicating with the SROs to make sure that everything's included? We work with the Kentucky Center for School Safety as well as uh, Housing and Building Codes. And that's that will be something that we will, you know, I'll kind of get a, a package together on that as well. So any new construction, of course, you know, renovations are a little different, but, you know, the there and this gets into some previous budgets, but there was funding out there for some changes to like uh, vestibules and um more security focused stuff, but a new construction, I believe it's required in these projects. And that gets into, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. It's crime prevention. It's part of the, uh, and I'll get you some more information on that, but absolutely we, we will work with Kentucky Center for School Safety to make sure all that's included. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just looking forward to those uh, 
Am I correct on the number 12 to 14 school? I think so. I, I'll double check that. I think okay. that you're in the neighborhood. And you're very a, close. If you're off by one or two, I think you're very close. And it's across the state, isn't it? So Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can we clarify these 12 to 14 schools are schools that are currently in the middle of a construction project that now are getting priced out to finish? Is that these 12 or 14 that we're discussing? I, I think that's a re I think that's a reasonable statement. I think they're either at the very what I would call the shovel is hitting the ground or has hit the ground. Okay. Uh, it's, it's kind of at that point where it's, you know, jump or not, I think. Uh, I'm looking through some of a, this is a really rough draft of a list, but I believe, I know one has probably gotten started, uh, but the rest of them look like they're probably just kind of waiting uh, to see if they can afford the rest of the project. So. Okay, good. We've got Senator Wheeler next. Thank you, Senator Southworth. Um, I, I guess one question I have, I know a lot of these are done with, uh, you know, project management where they're done kind of on a, a percentage basis. Uh you know, and I understand the concept of inflation, but have, have, have we looked at maybe reevaluating those formulas a little bit in the sense that just because the price of the materials go up doesn't necessarily mean the cost of managing the project itself has gone up. You know what I'm saying? And it also right. provides some incentive to maybe make a more expensive school or apply for more change orders. Uh, have we looked at, um, at kind of... Uh, maybe reevaluating some of those criteria on these on these projects yes and one of the things we're reviewing as part of that house bill 678 which is i didn't really put much in that slideshow about it was the the requirement that kde is reviewing um, all of our regulations as it relates to construction and inside those regulations are a lot of documents some of which get into construction management fees and things like that so we're reviewing how those are set um, and we really, I think, you know, I think this is a collective, we really want districts to negotiate uh, to the extent possible. Um, you know, there's language in one of the regulations about they shall negotiate architect fees. And we find that to be important because just like you and I, if we hire a builder, um, you know, we may negotiate because we're doing, you know, hey, we're going to make this a little easier on you. Or, you know, we, we know you want this project very badly. Uh, you may have a little more leverage to negotiate. And, and that to me is a, a very fair way because districts obviously uh, are you know, free to work with those construction firms that they feel comfortable with and negotiate those fees, um, sort of like with your auditors uh, and people like that um, and for other professional services. So I think that's very well worth looking into. And I think that's going to be part of the review process that we complete with House Bill 678 as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? My only question, I wanted to just clarify, very base level. The um, funding that we give for the School Facilities Construction Commission, is that just a line item in the budget? And does that come through? Where does that come through? So that is a couple. Of, actually, I think it's two line items are the two I usually look at. Um, there's one called Additional Offers of Assistance. And this is uh, in the last budget, I'm going to say $85 million. And this is kind of the big chunk that they, based on the percentage of need that the offers are made to districts. So for example, I'm district A, or I'll just pick on Adair County since they're the first district I have in A's. Adair County's um, portion of the unmet need is 3%. So they would get an offer of 3% of that, for example. And the, the world of SFCC gets a little complicated because if a district isn't in the midst of doing some projects and SFCC has their own set of rules about their money should be used on that priority list one and two, you know, so you need to address your ones, if you will. So this is a little more focused. Uh, I think that's the best way of kind of putting it is that when the money comes from school facilities construction commission, it's pointing to a higher priority. And if they're not ready to address that, they can sort of um, delay taking that offer. And I don't, I don't want to use the word turn it down because it's really they're just saying we're not quite ready to start this project. So, you know, we'll just leave that offer on the table for now. And then there's another chunk in the budget for special offers of assistance. It's right below that. And for context, let's see, it's page 34 of the budget, House Bill 1, the last budget. Um, 
that I don't know the total there because it's not totaled up for me, but I want to say that was it was well over 100 million. I can't recall, but that's the special offers. They did one for Bath County Middle, Bellevue or Grandview Elementary in Bellevue, uh, Cannonsburg Elementary in Boyd County, uh, Grant Slick in Campbell County, uh, Campbellsville Middle School, things like that. So that's where you get a little more specific to the schools rather than here's a you know, here's there, here's the pie for everyone. Then there's the, the the group that needs that special offer of assistance for whatever various reasons they have. Okay, thank you. Um, what I think I'm trying to get to the bottom of here, and it sounds like maybe we'll get a report back and we can perhaps go over it at our next meeting. Um, but what our co-chair McCool was saying, if we have school construction funds normally coming through, but they're not enough then it could either be a, you know, one-off budget committee decision, oh, we need to add money to the fund, or, um, you know, this body may need to look at stuff like we do maintenance pools and things like that. You know, maybe we need to look at an additional type of an item that we consider in our next plan to present so that it gets attention, because this kind of thing I doubt is going away. It sounds like a lot of these projects are just stalled out at the moment. Um, but we certainly will try to keep our hands on that as we go forward the rest of this year. And then, of course, preparing next year for our um, projects, for our budget. Um, does anybody have anything else that they would like to ask before we um, release our special guest speaker here? I can see none. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, Mr. Ritter. Appreciate your um detailed presentation and we'll look forward to getting those other questions and be in touch if there's anything else. Uh, all right. Members, thank you. Certainly. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Committee members certainly can get with our staff to add your questions. If you, there are any reports or whatever that you want to get from him on this particular issue. Um, our final agenda item, which we don't normally spend a lot of time on says other business. Um, a couple of things came to my mind. I wanted to go ahead and throw them in here. Our policy recommendations at the beginning of our capital planning report every year have remained semi-stable for the last at least few rounds and, and more than that even. Um, but it's, it's the three things that we have done. One is the budget reserve trust fund. That's our priority one. And you can see obviously this year it's all over the place because we have federal funds and things that have changed that. But our priority uh, says we want to shoot for 5%, and I'm told that we're going to have those numbers um, in time for the next meetings. So we want to review that because we've never yet seen, other than the extra slush funding from the federal side of things, um, where we're at right now, we've never seen that 5% realized, um, actually accomplished. So that's something we probably want to keep on our radar. But the other policy items we also have are the maintenance pools, which we're finally starting to see. Um, but like I said, we're doing bond funds for the CBE maintenance pools. That concerns me because um, maintenance pools and bond funds uh, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense um, as long-standing, long-term policy. So we want to look at that. In next um, meeting, we'll hopefully have more information on that as well. And then finally, um, the other policy priority we have is uh, the... Let's see, budget reserve, uh, maintenance pool. I've, uh, it's escaped me and I've got it on my list here and I'm out of order here on my list. But anyway, the item that Senator Wheeler just brought up, and I want to bounce off of this, he was asking about criteria for the construction management fees. Then we just heard about architects, all of these type of things. This is the type of criteria that this group, the school facilities group has um, but in our planning process, we don't necessarily have that in our policy statements. And perhaps one of the things we'll want to take a look at this year, preparing for next year, is what type of a policy priority do we want to put or what kind of statements do we want to put out there um, as, as people are bringing us projects. Because if you recall, this is not the first time it's happened, but last year you know, we had an agency request and the question was, you know, can you do this for less money? And they said, oh, of course we can. Um, we've got 
different levels of plans. We could do the 80 million version, we could do the 100 million version, or we could do the 120 million version. And this committee is not seeing that. All we're getting is a flat figure. So another policy item we might want to consider is do we want these agencies to specify whether their project has different tiers, phases, or whatnot that can be broken out, how it would be broken out. Some things are just lump sum, you just can't get around it, and others there's all kinds of flexibility and, and we're talking about limited funds all the time. You know, something we're always wondering is, could we just give you this much and that would get you down the road and someone else would get their priority taken too. So um, at staff's recommendation, I am thinking this is a good idea. We can maybe send out a survey. Um, if you all don't want to discuss, that, take up meeting time discussing, but your thoughts on, you know, where you would like to focus as we prepare for the next year's um, agency spending plan, um, what things like that, that you would think, oh, we need to take a look at this, take a look at that, so staff can prepare data um, for us to take a look at and maybe roll into our policy considerations um, for our next uh, biennial report. Does anybody have any other questions, business? Yes, Director Hicks. Thank you, Madam Chair. You were talking about the Budget Reserve Trust Fund. Last year, we achieved over 10%. Uh, as, as a target, and here in uh, next week, you're going to hear a much larger number. And he's going to have the secret information before we all have it. <laughs> and we will make sure we review it at our next meeting, which is not until September 14th. Um, this is scheduled at 10 a.m. Uh, right here again. Any other thoughts or motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All right. Well, without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you all.